I am Gabor Hoichi. That's my Twitter handle if you want to get in contact later. I unfortunately don't have availability to be around here later today, so um, I need to go back to family and enjoy the weekend together. Um, so I work for Acquia uh, for quite a few years, and these are the kind of badges that I get usually at events. So a lot of events do not um, let me write my own name, uh, like this one does, they pre-print my name, but they often not make it right. So there's always font type issues, there's uh, typing issues, and that's kind of indicative of how Drupal approached multilingual in previous versions. So it may or may not have worked in previous Drupal versions before Drupal 8. And it's even indicative of the industry in general. So this is an email I got from Twitter a month ago. And if you're not seeing that, that's my Gabor Hoichi. Thank you. So, um, so yeah, so multilingual is kind of a hard problem. I started working on Drupal's multilingual capabilities 13 years ago in 2003. And the reason I started working on it is because we needed a system for weblabor.agu, the web development community in Hungary. And Drupal didn't know Hungarian, right? So Drupal wasn't translated to Hungarian. And a lot of limitations were there that, that blocked us from translating it to Hungarian. So for me to be able to translate it to Hungarian, I needed to get involved in making it uh, be able to do it in the first place. And since then, uh, we managed to involve a lot of people. So the last thing we did is Drupal 8 Multilingual Initiative. Uh, we worked for four and a half years, and some of us are still going on. And this is the team. In fact, this would be the complete team. So it's around 1,300 people in total who worked on Drupal 8's multilingual capabilities. And this means that they either provided feedback, they reported issues, they tested patches, they did usability testing, they designed user interfaces, they nitpicked patches, they fixed issues, all kinds of things. And the problems with, we started with is how Drupal 7 approaches multilingual. How many of you have created a Drupal 7 multilingual site? Yes. So you're heroes. Because you kind of start from locale module, which is nice. It allows you to set up a list of languages. It allows you to translate the user interface to multiple languages. But you need the only thing locale module allows you is either enter the translations on the user interface, which you're not going to do, or um, upload PO files into the system and then use them. So if you have 100 modules and you have 10 languages, then you need to identify the version numbers of the 100 modules one by one and then download translation files for, ten of, for um, each of them by 10 for every 10 language. So now you downloaded 1,000 PO files to your desktop, and then you manually upload 1,000 PO files. It's painful. So we created the localization update module that automates that. It identifies the versions, downloads the files, imports the files, makes it very easy. So that's solved in Drupal 7. And then the only other thing in core for uh, multilingual is content translation module that allows you to translate nodes in the system to other nodes. It makes copies of those nodes, and that's it. Nodes also have menu items, but menu items, not translatable. Nodes also take taxonomy terms, but taxonomy terms, not translatable. So there's a lot of pain there. So you install the I18N module, which finally allows you to translate menu items and taxonomy terms. But it still does not allow you to translate your site name or the emails that are sent out to users or whatever, all of those things. So you also install the variable module suite, and now the variable module suite allows you to translate those as well. But then you have the web form module on your site, and none of these will allow you to translate web forms. So you also download the web form localization module, which the naming is totally inconsistent with the rest of the modules. And then, you still have views, and none of these will allow you to translate views. So you also download the I18N views module, which, by the way, is not consistently, consistently named with any of the other modules. And then 
you set up an e-commerce store on your site, and then none of these will allow you to translate your e-commerce store on your site. So you also install the entity translation module, which then allows you to translate those things as well. But now you have two ways to translate taxonomy terms. You either use the entity translation module or the IATN module. Uh, and I, in fact, we ran into this with a company that they were trying to translate it with IATN and it didn't work, and it turned out that they used to use IATN for taxonomy translation, but now they use entity translation, and the data was still there, and it's a mess. And you also have two ways to translate content now, because entity translation will allow you to translate nodes as well as content translation. So you have two ways to translate content, two ways to translate taxonomy terms, but they are not the same two ways. It's a mess. And then you still cannot translate actual nodes with the system. You still need the title module to replace the title of your nodes and taxonomy terms and other things to actually be able to translate them. And what about field collections and paragraphs? Yes. So there's a huge mess of modules and they overlap in random ways. And so if you manage to make this work, then you are definitely heroes. And there's a lot of people who can make this work. So there's the, there's the World Health Organizations, there's uh, CERN, there's UNESCO, a lot, of, a lot of sites, multilingual, Drupal 7, they work. But the problem is you need a lot of investment to make this work. You need a lot of know-how to make this work. And what we wanted to do in Drupal 8 is to make this very simple, have a few simple subsystems that cover as much as possible and make it much easier to understand. So we made four pillars for this in Drupal 7, and you may have seen this in Jem's session in the morning. I've seen the photograph of him presenting the same slide. So basically, we made a language pillar because we need a way to understand language in general in the system. Drupal 7 does not know the language of a view that you created or a language of the taxonomy term that you created or or a language of a menu item that you created. It has no idea. So it needs to make assumptions. And those assumptions are always bad because they turn into problems later on when you change the default language or enter content in a different language or do something other funky or even not funky basic things. So we need to have a general understanding of language in the whole system. Then we know the language of every single thing in the system and then we can do whatever we want with that. We can translate to other languages, remove specific languages, or do whatever we want. So that removes a lot of assumptions. So we made that possible in Drupal 8. That's not possible. And we also wanted to have much better language, uh, language system settings, language defaults for content, and all kinds of other usability improvements that we didn't have in Drupal 8, so Drupal 7. So we've Im improved that in 8. The second pillar that we have in Drupal 8 is the interface translation pillar. So this is basically the, the successor to the locale module. This has localization update features integrated. So when you install Drupal 8, the first screen that you see in Drupal 8 is asking you about your language. And it also pre-selects your language uh, based on your browser preference. So if your browser preference is properly set, then all you need to do is press next. And then everything from there is translated to your language, everything, uh, if your translation team completed your translation. So um, all the rest of the install screens, every configuration, every view, every user role, everything is translated. And we've also improved the interface for translation itself in Drupal. And we've also made it possible to diverge from translations so you can make customizations to these community translations locally. And we've also made it possible to translate English to other languages to modify English interface text. And then we have one unified way to translate content, which is a successor to the entity translation module from Drupal 7. So this is not the same as the content translation module in 7. We removed that module from core. And now we have an, a new module that's called uh, content translation, but it's now the entity translation modules uh, functionality. We made every f every field support translation. So title field, author field, file field, etc. They all support translation. And also we support translation on the sub field level. 
So even for files, you can make the file label and the file image itself separately translatable. So if you run a store, you can use the same image across all the translations of a product, and you can translate the title and the alt text of the image and keep the image the same. Or you can also configure it to have separate images. If you run a blog, you want separate language illustrations for your blog posts. So this is one single way to translate content, and it applies to everything in the system. So whether it's menu items or taxonomy terms or nodes or user profiles or all kinds of other things, this is one system for everything. And it also applies to all of Contrib for e-commerce, for rules, whatever else uses the content system is going to uh, benefit of this. And finally, we have a configuration translation system. So Drupal 8 comes with this new configuration system that is much better for site deployments. You can package up your configuration and deploy it and then see differences between different environments. And language is built into that system as well. So you can translate whatever is in your configuration. And in fact, Drupal will translate your configuration by default if you install Drupal in a foreign language. So if you install Drupal in Hungarian, in my case, then all your configuration will be in Hungarian. And then you can edit your views in Hungarian and edit your user, etc. And Drupal will know about that natively. And then you can create new configuration in whatever language is configured on your site. So you can create new views in, um, in Turkish, and you can create new user roles in German, and then you can create new input formats in US American, whatever you want. And then you can translate from there to other languages. So everything knows its language, and everything is translatable in configuration as well. And now we'll see each system one by one from the high level view of the developer. So this was the side builder introduction to multilingual in Drupal 8. And now we'll go into the high level view of what the developer sees um, in Drupal 8 in terms of these systems. So the first system is the language system. And there, um, this uses pretty standard Drupal 8 practices. So in Drupal 8, we have the language manager which manages the list of languages on the, on the site. So it basically keeps track of what kind of languages you have. And Drupal knows your languages even if you do not have language module enabled. So Drupal 8 has an understanding of language on every Drupal 8 site because it needs to store all that data about your content language and configuration language. Maybe two years later you want to add two more languages to the site and two years later, we need to know what you did for two years. So we need to keep track of that information. So we have a language manager that is available and, and, it, and it works on every Drupal 8 site. And if you enable the language module, then that's replaced by the configurable language manager, which basically allows you to configure the list of languages and does some other fancy things. So if you want to know the list of languages and other fun things, you need to use the language manager. And that has methods for uh, getting the most important information. So get languages would get you a list of all the languages on the site. On the Drupal 8 site that does not have language module enabled, these three languages are available. So you have uh, UND, which is not specified, and ZXX, which is not applicable. This comes from the understanding in Drupal 7 that we've had UND and you didn't understand what UND is. So now we duplicated it, so you doubly don't understand what they are. Um, yeah, so we still have UND, which means uh, not uh, specified. So we would use UND for cases where the thing may have a language, but you have no idea. So if you have a PDF document of a book, but you don't know what language of the book is in, then that is UND. If you have a photograph of a cat, there's no meaning in associating language to the photograph of a cat. There's no linguistic information to associate. Then that's ZXX, that's not applicable. So basically the difference between the two is not applicable means that there's no linguistic meaning of this thing. There's no meaningful way to assign the language. And UND means this is probably in some language, but I don't know. 
Okay. So the system allows you later on to find these two different things uh, separately that people used to lump up together under one thing. And then we have English by default on a site that does not have language module enabled. Okay. And once you have language module enabled, then you can remove English. So one of the new things in Drupal 8 is English can be deleted. It's a configurable language. It does not need to be there at all. In fact, it is removed by default if you install it in a foreign language. And you can configure however many number of languages you want. So in this case, I configured Hungarian and Italian, but you can configure however many languages you want. And these are stored in the configuration system itself. So if you export your site configuration, you get a zip file. And in, the, in that zip file, you will find these YAML files, and these will be in there. So there's going to be language that entity dot, and then the language code that YAML files in the zip file that you get from the configuration system. And the language code is UNDZXX, AGU, and IT in this case. And then the other special thing is we have the built-in languages are logged, and these configurable languages are not logged, which basically means that the locked languages do not expose deletability and editability on the user interface. So if you have a distribution or a site and you want to have hard-coded languages that nobody can touch, that nobody can edit, that nobody can delete, then you can ship configuration as locked languages and then, um, then people will not be able to remove them. So you can also use locked languages yourself for your system if you want to hard-code languages into your uh, distribution or your um, customer site. So these are the languages. And then you can create these languages programmatically. The configurable language class is our entity class, configuration entity class for languages. So it has a create from langcode method that makes it very easy to create a new language object. In this case, you give it a language code and it will look up the name of the language and other things in a um, list that we have in core. And then you can save it to the configuration system. So basically this three line snippet, which is one line, will create you a new language, save it in your configuration system, in your active configuration. So when you export your configuration, it will now have French on the site. And then you can also just load this later on with configurable language load and delete it or do whatever, change its name, label, whatever you want. So very easy to programmatically create these languages and, uh, and manipulate them. And then once you have a list of languages, you need a way to pick a language for the page. And Drupal has a language negotiation system to pick languages for pages. And by default, there is the interface translation, in, interface language that is selected for the page based on your configuration, maybe the URL path, maybe the domain, maybe user preference, maybe all kinds of other things. And you can, of course, programmatically access the same thing. So if you want to programmatically access the language that was selected for the page, then the language manager has a get current language method that gives you the language that was selected for this request. And then you can use that language if you have an external API or whatever that you need to interface with and use the same language for the page, then you can use this language and communicate with the external API. So very easy to use the same language that the system otherwise uses for the page. Okay. That's the short introduction to the language system. And then the interface translation system is kind of interesting because in Drupal 7, we've had this very shiny, nice T function, right? So we've had T English text and it gave us the translation. How many of you are familiar with the T function? Okay, quite a few of you, nice. So this gave you the translation. And that's kind of nice because this works in Drupal 8. You call the T function, it gives you the translation. There's a few caveats, quite a few caveats. So we should rather forget about this for now and then uh, see what's better. So basically the problem with calling the global T function is it, for, as a first thing, it assumes that you have a global T function. It assumes that you have a global translation service for your um, uh, use. So it kind of works like this, that you have your logic 
and you're calling out to these global services, you're calling out to the global user, you're calling out to the global configuration, you're calling out to the global translation system, and that's not good because it makes a lot of assumptions about your services. Also very hard to test because you need all of, this, all of these environments to set up for your code to be testable. And as I generally just not, does not let you uh, encapsulate your code. So in Drupal 8 instead, uh, the usual best practice is dependency injection, which is a very fancy term, but basically instead of calling out to these dependencies outside, you inject these dependencies, you have a reference to these services in your um, object, in your logic, and then you can use those references and then you can mock those um, dependencies when you need to test them, or you can replace those dependencies later with different services. So this allows us a lot of flexibility later on to build on top of this. So one of the things that the translation system does here, for example, is it has different backends for translation based on whether you are in the installer or in the live system or doing an update or those things, and you don't need to care about that. In Drupal 7, you've had the ST method and the uh, ST function and the T function and the dollar T, whatever, and then you need to mix them and use them based on the right environment. And we don't need to do that in 8 anymore because the service that we inject is the right one for the right environment, basically. So instead of doing this, most of the classes that you will encounter will have a T method directly on them, which which uses the injected translation service. So you just use the T method in, in the class that, was, that is using the injected service. So if, you, if your code is a block or if it's a configuration entity or whatever, then it will already have this T method injected. If you need a, th a T method, then there's a string translation trait that you can use, and it will include methods for getting the translation manager and the T method and plural formatting and other things. So very easy to get this uh, for yourself as well. And then that becomes uh, your local T method. The other thing that changed in Drupal 8 is the T method will not return a string anymore. So when you call T, you can also do this. So what the T method or even the global T function, which still works, will return for you is an object. So this is actually very useful because we don't actually need to translate the string at the point when you ask for the translation. We can translate it at the point when the translation is actually needed later on because Drupal builds up a lot of things for the page and then throws out a lot of things for the page and then alters some things for the page. So in Drupal, the life cycle of the page is a lot of uh, building and altering and modification. And we don't need to do all the translations for things that will not reach the page at the end. So when we get there and need to translate it, we'll translate it later on. So this is a nice performance optimization. It also allows us to call T much earlier when none of the translation system is ready yet because we just create that object and it's later on translated when we need to translate it. And it also allows you to uh, reformat the translation later on. So in this case, we can ask what language code was used to translate this string. We can ask for the original string. We can ask for the arguments. We can ask for a lot of things that the T method was used to, um, uh, used to uh, be invoked with. So this is an object that's later on translated. When you cast it to a string, it will be translated automatically at that point. So it's translated in the Drupal rendering pipeline when the string is casted, or when the object is cast to a string. And then format plural is practically the same thing. Uh, the only difference is there's not a global format plural function anymore. So you cannot even try to use it. It's not there. The global T function is there but the global format plural function is not there anymore, so you need to use the method. And then if you use the JavaScript API, did not change in any way. It's still the T method and the format plural method on the Drupal global object. JavaScript, not such a big movement in, uh, in Drupal 8. And then there's these magic things in Drupal 7 that are info hooks 
and um, meta information and all kinds of other things that you did not use the T function with, like hook menu. Hook menu became some other systems in Drupal 8. And one of these systems is the links.menu.yaml uh, file. So links.menu.yaml is your menu links that your module exposes. And basically you provide the menu title and the menu description in these links. And obviously these need to be translatable. But, but this is not PHP code, so you cannot just put in the T function there and make it translatable. It's not possible. So what Drupal has for this is Drupal has an understanding of these YAML plugin configuration files and knows which keys are translatable in these files and will automatically translate these strings later when the plugin instantiates the plugin instances for these links. Um, <clears throat> if you need to create your own plugins in Drupal 8, you have a module and you need to create your own plugins, then you can look at the POTX module, which has a definition format for the module to, to explain which of your keys are translatable. So you can explain for your own plugins which of your keys are translatable in your plugin configuration files. But the, all the Drupal default plugins, like menu links, routes, um, permissions, all of these are already defined. So all these well-known keys will be translatable. You don't need to do anything for this. It will automatically work. No PHP code required. Just put in these menu links and this will just work. Okay. So that's the interface translation uh, API, at least a short introduction of the interface translation API. And the um, most important thing to remember here is this still works from English to some other language. So this assumes that the source code is English and then uses the source text from English and translates it to other languages, okay? And then the content translation system is a lot more interesting. So what I've said is content in Drupal 8 now means nodes, menu items, taxonomy terms, comments, um, user profiles, all of these things. So these things usually ha can have fields on them, can have configurable fields, and are defined as content entities. So when you define a content entity, you define it as a class with annotations. This is the node content entity definition, at least a short snippet of node content entity definitions. So it says it's a content entity type in node.php. And the ID is node and it's a content entity. And this basically means that this node content entity type is translatable. And it also defines that the lang code key is used for maintaining the language code of nodes. So if you define your own content entity type, if you are Drupal Commerce or Rules or Five Star or any of these modules that may define their own content entity types, then you need to use these keys in class annotations for the content entity. And there you can say, this may be translatable. This does not mean that all nodes on the Drupal 8 site will be translatable, okay? What this says is the user of the site, the administrator, may configure nodes to be translatable. So this just says that that is, is available for translation. It does not say that it will always be translatable, okay? So it's a configuration whether your nodes are translatable and in fact, it's per content type, so your articles may be translatable while your pages may not be translatable. This just says that nodes may be configured to be translatable. And then, each entity type can have base fields. Nodes have a lot of base fields. They have author, they have created date, they have title, they have, uh, I don't know, a lot of things, language code. Um, and these are defined in base field, def uh, base field definitions method on node.php. And there, each base field, again, can get a default setting for translatability. So in this case, we say the title of the node is translatable. So it can be made translatable when you configure nodes to be translatable. Okay? Again, this is what it means. 
So this allows basically Drupal to translate titles, no need for a title module anymore. So that's um, base fields. And then configurable fields, if you have a configurable field, like a number field, like a string field, like a five star field, whatever, easy. Because the field system supports translatability. So if you have configurable fields, there's nothing to say for you for it to be translatable or not. The field system supports translatability of fields on uh, entities. So it's all automated. You don't need to do anything special for that. If you have a complex field, as I've said, image fields, they have a file and they have a title field and they have an alt tags. Then field types also come with annotations. So this is the image field annotation for the field type. You can define a column group, which basically sets up these groups of data for the field. And you can say, I have a group of data for the file itself, which is the target ID, the width, and the height of the file. And then I have a group of data for the alt text, which is one column, the alt text. And then it goes on for the group of data for a title. And then there's these group of data that can be separately configured for translatability again. So people can make the file itself translatable and the alt text itself translatable, etc. So if you have a basic field type like numbers or strings or dates, then you don't need to touch your field definition. If you have a complex field type, like image fields, then you can um, separate the complex field type to subfields and say, I have this subfield and that subfield and that subfield, and they are separately translatable. And you don't need to do anything beyond this annotation. Drupal maintains the data. It copies around the data properly for translations and everything. So you don't need to deal with the mechanics of how it's actually translated or not uh, on the actual site. So it's very easy, you just need to define your logic, your, uh, your um, uh, not the logic, your uh, idea of which column groups are available and then Drupal handles the rest. And again, this applies to everything in the content system. So it doesn't matter if it's a user profile or a taxonomy term or a menu item or node or commerce product, it doesn't matter, it's the same system. And also using all the content entities is the same system. So the node content entity class is node and you can load a node the same way as we've seen for language. It just has, has a load method. You give it a node ID and it gives you node 42. It's an object. And then the object has useful methods. Get translation will return the actual translation that you requested. So in this case, Hungarian. If the Hungarian translation does not exist, it still gives you a new Hungarian translation, it will be empty, uh, that you can still use the same way as it was the original. This, made, this makes it very easy in Drupal 8 to work with translations because the node you get back is, still has the same methods, it still has the same columns, it still, it still does the same as the node object did before. If you want to use language negotiation in the entity, uh, retrieval process. If you want to retrieve the right translation with language, language negotiation, then the entity repository service has a get translation from, from context method that runs all the language negotiation as it would run for the page and it gives you the right translation. So in this case, you don't know the language. You want to use the same language that the content language system uses for the page and the entity repository does the language negotiation for you and just gives you the right language. And once you have a node or a content entity in whatever language, it has all kinds of useful things. You can get back the original untranslated version, the original language variant. You can ask for the language itself for this translation. You can ask about the translation languages, which is basically what languages is this translated to is a list of all the languages that that's already uh, this entity is already translated to you can ask if there is a hungarian translation or not you can add the new hungarian translation you can remove a hungarian translation so this is a very intelligent object 
you can ask for your translation and you can work the same way with fields. You can add remove stuff and you can move um, to different uh, variants and ask about languages. So, so the content entity system natively understands language and supports language variants very easily. You may not want to work with this API, by the way, if all you want is nodes displayed or not, not just nodes, content entities general displayed in the right language. All you're going to use is views. Views in Drupal 8 has built-in language support in both ways in views. So basically views is a query builder and views is a display uh, configurator, right? So you build a query, you have a result, and then you use that result and you display it somehow. And both are very powerful in views. You can display it in a grid, a gallery, images, thumbnails, fields, whatever. And you can use the query to join in all kinds of tables and use whatever data you want. So both are very powerful and both have language support. The first column has the query language support. So in this case, this is the default front page view in Drupal 8. It says, I want to ask for content translated to the content language selected for the page. So basically, only language uh, translations that are useful for this language selected for the page. And then the second feature of views is how this is displayed, as in the second column, where we say language rendering language is the content language as it was found in the query. But this can also display the original translation of the entity found or display in a specific language, or display in the user's preferred language, or whatever else. So you can create a query, what's not already translated to Hungarian, and then render it in, in uh, Spanish, or do whatever other funky stuff you want with views. And then views are configuration, so you can export this, these views, and then use them uh, in your deployment system. So it's very easy to build these views and reuse them in different environments. So that's very powerful in the configuration, uh, in the content translation system, because it applies to everything, both in terms of how views works, both in terms of how language support works, and in terms of how the translation system works. So that was the third area, multilingual Drupal 8, content translation, and this allows you to create content in whatever language you want, and then translate it to whatever other languages you want. And it uses very intelligent objects that know about their language, that can ask about other languages, that can manipulate languages and do all kinds of other things. So that's uh, also pretty powerful and it applies to everything from user profiles to e-commerce, okay? Very powerful. The last one is configuration. So configuration is in these fancy YAML files when you look at a module, uh, for example, system module, in this case, it will have a system maintenance YAML file, which is the configuration for what text is displayed when the site is in maintenance mode. And every single configuration file has a language as well. So this knows that this configuration is in English. When you create a view, it will be created in your language as when you create it, and it will know about its language. When you create a vocabulary, it will know its language. When you create a new user role, it will know its language. So everything that has a text that maybe uh, may get language knows its language. In this case, this file knows that the message is in English, okay? And then we need the system to explain what's translatable in configuration. So your site will probably come with default views and field configuration and entity types and all kinds of other things. We already have definition for what's translatable in those. But if you have configuration yourself in your module, you need a way to explain this. So this file has two keys, message and lang code. It's basically an associative uh, list of uh, two keys. And we have uh, typing information for this. So we have a configuration schema system in Drupal 8 that allows developers to explain 
the data structure of the configuration files. So we have the configuration object type, which says that uh, it's an associative mapping and has a LAN code key. So basically this LAN code key is defined because this is gonna be a configuration object. And then we have base types like string that we subtype to text that is a translatable string. And then we use these types to define configuration. So we say system maintenance is a configuration object that also takes a message key, which is a translatable string. So basically we have a configuration schema system that allows you to explain the configuration data types. And this is used by the translation system to identify the system maintenance message as translatable because it says that system maintenance is an associative array that has a language code key and a message key. The language code key comes from the config object type and the message key comes from this type uh, specializing from the configuration object. And the message key is a translatable string because it's a text, okay? So configuration schema is basically subtyping from very basic types to very special types. It looks a bit complex at the start, but it's very easy to get a hang of it. We uh, onboarded a lot of new people who didn't know anything about configuration schema and could write configuration schema for views in a matter of days. So I think it's easy to get, um, get on board this. So once again, we have the message key and the LAN code key. LAN code is a reserved key for maintaining the language code which we reserved on the configuration object. And then we have keys like, uh, and then we define additional keys like message that make it translatable as a text key. So what we do then is we store the configuration for the system maintenance message in the active configuration. So when you install Drupal, the configuration is copied over to your active configuration, system maintenance.yaml. And that says site is currently offline, blah, blah, blah. And then we store all the translations in the active configuration as well. So when you export your configuration, you'll see files like languages slash agu slash system.maintenance.yaml. And they will include translations of the keys that were translatable and have already translated uh, values. So in this case, the message will be translated to Hungarian there and then the same for Italian. So basically configuration translation is stored in the same configuration system as the rest of the configuration on the site. And they are stored as overrides, so they only store the keys that are translated and do not store the rest of the keys. So when you have a view and you translate that view, then the translation will only contain the display labels and the empty text and the previous next um, pager labels and those things that are translated, okay? And this is deployed with the configuration. So this is exportable altogether in the zip file that you get from Drupal 8 and is deployed to the live site or uh, can be pulled down from the live site to your dev environment as well. If you work on the PHP side for configuration is basically very easy, you use the configuration uh, factory. This is the global config factory, by the way, but there's, you can uh, use it as a service. So you ask for the system maintenance message and you get system maintenance and you get the message key from there. And this will use all the overrides for the page. So what's special for the configuration system is it supports overrides of whatever kind. So the content translation system only supports language variants, but the configuration system supports variants of whatever. Because you probably used domain module, and you probably used organic groups, and you probably used spaces, and you probably used global, global conf, global uh, configuration overrides, all of those things. So all of those modules allow you to set overrides, okay? So domain module 
allowed you in seven to set overrides per domain. Uh, organic groups module allowed you to set overrides per organic group, spaces, uh, global conf, all of those things. So Drupal 8 still supports the same variance of overrides. So this may get you an override based on your domain or the user role or whatever other system you have on the site. But it also applies the language overrides as well at the same time. So it applies everything. If you want to apply a specific language override, this is very ugly. Uh, but because the configuration system does not know of language overrides, we need to communicate with the language manager, which maintains the language overrides. So we can ask the language manager for the global language that it maintains for configuration. Hey, language manager, what's the global configuration override language? And then we can set a new one, set me this configuration override language, and then we can use the configuration, and then we can restore the previous one. It's very ugly, it's not nice, I'm sorry, but Configuration supports variants of whatever overrides you want. So it does not have explicit understanding of get me this translation because there's no get me this translation. It's just overrides that are put together and then something results at the end. Okay? So this is a global understanding in the language manager. If you want to ignore every override, if you want to get the original configuration that is in the active store, then there is the config factory get editable method. So basically, if you want to get configuration that you can actually save it to, then you would use config factory get editable. Because if you get an object from Drupal config, it will not allow you to save back to configuration. It will throw, um, throw an exception and say, haha, you are not allowed. Because it applies all the overrides. So if you save that, then it will totally break your configuration in the active store, okay? Because it will allow, it will apply your global overrides, your domain overrides, all of those things. So those are not supposed to be saved back to your original configuration. But if you want to deal with the original configuration, you can get it from the config factory get editable method. And if you want to work with the override itself, then that's managed by the language manager. As I've said, the language manager knows about the overrides and the config factory knows about the configuration in the configuration line. So you can say, language manager, please get me the language config override for system maintenance in Hungarian and please set a new message of blah, blah, blah and then save the language override. So this deals with only the Hungarian language override specifically. And this deals with only the original language. And this above gets you um, an object that has every override that may apply here uh, stacked on top of each other. There's a priority system that defines whether your global overrides or domain overrides or language overrides or whatever other override applies on top of each other. And then you can basically configure that to uh, have the right system for your own needs. Okay, so that's the configuration translation API. So basically, in configuration, you can create configuration in whatever source language you want, and you can translate it to whatever other language you want. All of these are stored in the configuration system in active storage. The translations are stored as overrides, but they are deployed together to live. You can deal with the override itself, you can deal with the original configuration itself, or you can deal with whatever was assembled together. And these are mostly dump arrays because it, basically the configuration system loads all of this data and then merges them together from all the overrides and then instantiates an object for you and then you deal with the object. But it doesn't really know if there was a global override or a language override or a domain override or whatever. So you cannot ask the config object about its translations or whether it's in a specific language or whatever because it has no idea whatsoever. Okay. So in summary, Drupal 8, I think we made a huge stride in uh, language support. We know the language of everything. Uh, we put in um, 
a lot, of, lot more flexibility in terms of interface translation. We now have PO file downloads and uh, imports built in. Um, we made the interface translation API itself easier to use. You only use one method on whatever class you are, the T method. You don't need to deal with ST and T and all kinds of other things. And it's optimized, so it's translated only later on when it's actually needed. And then we built a content translation system that applies to everything from user profiles to products to menu items, taxonomy terms, et cetera, and translates fields, subfields, and configurable very flexibly. Uh, it makes it possible for you to opt in or out of translatability on your node types and on your base fields and allows you to make it configurable for your complex field types to have uh, sections of translatability, column groups. And then we have a general configuration system that also supports translation and all kinds of other overrides and stores the language of configuration natively and then uses these overrides in the configuration system altogether as part of the deployment. So very easy to use in your normal deployment workflow. If you want to work on any of these things, improve any of these things, or port your modules and want help, then I will be at uh, Drupal Dev Days Milan as well. And then, obligatory marketing, I will be at uh, Drupalaton too. Uh, it's August 11th to 14th. It's now a new town, not the same old town as before. It's much closer to here as well. It's in Balaton Amadi. And finally, once again, uh, I'd like to thank all these people because they made it possible for you to now translate everything in Drupal 8 and also have APIs for dealing with language uh, for everything in general. And once again, all of those folks. And I may have like two minutes for questions because we are late for however many minutes. But that was my session, thank you. Yes. Mm -hmm. So the question was what kind of improvements are expected in Drupal 8's lifetime in terms of multilingual? So Drupal 8 changed dramatically in terms of how the releases are made. And now we are making releases every six months. So we've already released Drupal 8.1, uh, and we are going to release 8.2 in October. And these releases every six months may come with however many new features, which is, I think, amazing. Uh, in 8.1, we've already made it possible to, we've already in enabled a spell checking in CK Editor, and we've already added a new language button in CK Editor, so you can specify language within the text area, if you have multilingual content within one text area, you can specify language of snippets of text. So we've already improved that um, in 8.1. Uh, we are fixing a whole lot of bugs that are also released in point versions and some of them are released in these versions. I think what I'm looking forward to is definitely more usability improvements. So one of the things we are looking at is how to integrate in-place editing with translations, because now it's very easy to in-place edit some content on the page. It's also very easy to in-place edit a translation of a content on a page, because it's the same. But if you have a piece of content, you still need to go to a totally separate page to create a translation, and then you can come back and in-place edit the page. But you still need to like go elsewhere and go to the translate tab and there's an add button, you need to hit that and then you get a form and then you submit the form and then you re return back to the front, front end and now you see the translation that is still in the original language and then you can use in-place editing to do translations. So one of the things we are looking at is to simplifying that flow and make it this easy to create me a translation of this and then let me in-place translate the thing. Um, that's one of the things that um, that I'm looking forward to. Uh, we are still in the brainstorming phase for that, so no promises of timelines whatsoever. 
Uh, and the other thing that we definitely need to improve is the migration path, because the migration path from Drupal 6 to 8 and 7 to 8 in terms of multilingual is not good. That's to say the least. So if you need to migrate a multilingual site, you will hit a lot of problems uh, in this migration path. So that's one of the things that we are focusing on to make, uh, make it easy to make it work. Um, and that's also going to be released in a future version. If you are interested in more information about what's in general Drupal 8 multilingual, then there's Drupal 8 multilingual.org. You go there, you can see a short video summary. You can see a demo site that you can hit and it has four languages installed and you can do whatever, change whatever you want. It has views, image fields, and all kinds of other things. Multilingual, Drupal 8. There's a showcase list of sites that are already Drupal 8 multilingual sites. Um, this demo has a handout, 21 pages of text that basically explains you how to click together the site. Uh, you can create the site yourself, just click it together. There's like very detailed click here, enter this, click here, enter this, that level. Um, so there's a lot of resources there in terms of how to get started, how to learn more about the site building aspects of Drupal 8 Multilingual. And my blog, if you go to my Twitter account, you can uh, see my uh, blog link uh, on Twitter. My blog has an article series on Drupal 8 Multilingual, which includes both site building and development posts, and has details of content API, configuration API, uh, interface transition API, all of these things. So you can um, dive into more details there. So you can just start with my Twitter account and then go to my site from there. I think I'm well, uh, well uh, into my time. So thank you once again.